Hey, Ron, how you doing? Uh, first thing you want to do is check your wind velocity chart, whether you're in the 80 or 100 mile an hour zone. And up here in Dallas, we're the 80. Down in Houston, it's a 100 mile an hour zone, for example. And it just has different requirements for the sizes of the poles and the, the foundation types. Um, your pole heights for any traffic signal pole can be anywhere from 19 feet to 30 feet if you have a luminaire on it. Um, a single mass, a single mast arm, an, an SMA is what the detail, text that detail calls. It can vary anywhere from 20 feet long to 48 feet long, and it goes in four foot increments. An LMA, which is a long mast arm, it goes from 50 feet all the way to 65 feet. And again, those are in five foot intervals. A dual mast arm, <clears throat> which is two arms off of a single pole, those can be from a 20 by 20 combination up to a 36 by 44 foot long pole combination. And again, all those intervals are in four foot intervals. You can also have a long dual mast arm where one arm can be anywhere from 50 to 65 feet with five foot intervals. And the second arm could be anywhere from 20 to 44 feet in four foot intervals. The largest combination of a dual mast arm is 65 by 44 feet. <clears throat> we came pretty close to that on one of the projects that I'll talk about. Uh, traffic signal foundation, uh, whenever you're designing one, you use the Texas cone petrometer, which measures the poles per foot once you get down a certain depth, and of course the wind velocity zone. A lot of times we don't use the, the Texas cone petrometer, we just take the worst case scenario on the chart, because it would cost more to get a geotech out to measure and, and take that reading than it is to just add three or four more feet of concrete. But if there's a, a project going on nearby, uh, roadway design, and they've got that, that data, we'll, we'll take it and use it and be a little more precise, but otherwise we will use the worst case scenario for bulls per foot. The foundation widths for foundation uh, for a single mast arm can vary anywhere from a 36 inch to a, or a 30 to a 36 inch foundation, DMA from a 30 to a 42 inch foundation, and then an LMA, the long mast arms, those are all 48 inch foundations. It's a pretty big four foot diameter foundation. And those lengths can vary anywhere from eight to 16 feet for an SMA, eight to 18 feet for a, a dual mast arm. And then the LMAs can vary anywhere from 15 to 22 feet in depth. And then the anchor bolts, which you can see on the detail to the right, those are, that's this right here, these anchor bolts. That's what the, the actual base plate of this traffic signal pole will attach to within this concrete foundation with all the rebar. Uh, for an SMA, they'll vary anywhere from one and a half to two inches in diameter. They'll go down three feet, four inches, down to four feet, three inches. To, uh, uh, DMA, uh, basically the same, go up to two and a quarter inch. The LMA, those are our big boys. Those are two and a half inch diameter, and those go, go down five foot, three inches. So real quick, that's just a, a real generic um, overview of foundations, signal poles. So project one we're going to talk about today is um, US 80 at Gateway Boulevard in Forney, Texas. And you can see the arrow there, and you can see it in relationship to Dallas. Um, that signal is approximately 10 miles outside of Dallas. Or, I'm sorry, 20 miles outside of Dallas. So it's just on the outskirts. And uh, the client, in this case, was Seafried Industrial Properties. Uh, they were building a large uh, distribution center. Uh, we, we won't name what that distribution center is for, but uh, it would probably be named after a South American rainforest, if you can imagine that, that would come and deliver things to your house. Enough said there. Um, the reviewing agencies were Tax.Dallas Dallas in the Sea of Forney. And this is a, built on a diamond, this was a diamond intersection, was, was built on an existing bridge, elevated bridge structure that was built or designed in 2011. And you can see this is kind of the gateway to the city. It's really nice, a lot of aesthetics at, at Forney, Texas over here. And there's also a railroad track over to the right. And uh, you can see the flag poles up there. So uh, they used to call this the bridge to nowhere because basically it's a huge bridge, looks beautiful, and then you get off the bridge and there's nothing out there, it led to an empty field. So now it's starting to develop like mad out there. So you can see, uh, again, these railroad tracks here. So this is a, an elevated bridge structure. And when we got out there to do our, our uh, field review, we got the as built. Here are the as built plans. And one of the nice things they did <clears throat> when they designed this bridge was they integrated the traffic signal pole foundation into the bridge structure. You can see the, the, the bents and the, and the whatnot here. And a dual mast arm here on top of this bent. 
And actually these are, are gonna be right on top of one of the columns. So it's really convenient that we put dual mast arm here, we put one there, a single, and then a dual over here, again on top of that vent, and then a single over here. And they also had some foundations for the ped poles. They had some uh, conduit system under the bridge, not much though, basically just a stub out with a ground, uh, not a ground box, but a junction box under the bridge. So we had to finalize all the rest of those uh, connections. They also had a, uh, a place to put your controller over here, your signal controller. So we we're thinking, oh, this is gonna be a breeze. We don't have to worry about foundations. You know, here's, here's the foundation detail they designed back almost 10 years ago now. And you can see this is the column for the bridge that goes out of the ground. There's one of the bents, bent cap. And then you can see the foundation for the signal poles actually built into that. You can see the anchor bolts and all the rebar and all that. Great, we're great. We go out in the field, we take pictures, everything is great. We get 60% design done, we submit it to TechStop, and they come back and they're like, what the heck are you guys doing? I'm like what? This is the anchor bolts when they went out to, to review it. We're like, wait a minute. That's not what it looked like when we were out there. That's the picture of that same anchor bolt right there just a few months prior when we did our field work. So when we try and, in between the time we did our field work, the text that went out a period of two months, a truck, I assume, or something big, hit these anchor bolts and bent them, all of them, as you can see, mangled them. It made us like idiots, but once we send them the photos, say, hey, look, here's our field photo. This, this is what we saw months ago. We were, we were covered. So anyways, we had to come up with a, a design to fix those anchor bolts. You can't just bend those anchor bolts back. They're brittle. Uh, they're holding a lot of weight, uh, cantilever, especially with a dual mast arm. So we uh, used the help of our structural engineer to help us design um, a solution. So here is that, that pole, the anchor bolt. You can see the dual mast arm we designed and there's the single mast arm. You can see the conduit system we got kind of going on. There's the match line. There's the other half of the bridge. Luckily, all the other anchor bolts were fine over there. So what we decided to do was <clears throat> we came up with a solution where this is the existing uh, foundation, up, existing pavement or the, the pole foundation and we're gonna have them chip away down nine inches. And then we're going to have them re, I wanna make sure I get this right. They're gonna thread, get a threading die and go back and re-dye the tops of the anchor bolts once we cut them off. Again, we were gonna cut them flush with the top of the foundation, chip away the foundation, and then re-dye these. Uh, we did look up online. There are dyes that are big enough to do this. It is not an easy process, but it's better, we thought, than digging out the entire foundation, especially since it's attached to the column. And then we designed this transfer plate. This transfer plate would then sit on top of the, those anchor bolts that were out there now that were covered in concrete that now were threaded. And we uh, especially designed this, ran all our structural analysis to get the right uh, thickness and the right type of steel for this base, this transfer plate. And what was neat was um, when you have a dual mast arm, your resulting resultant force is basically kind of at a 45 degree angle. Well, you always want your anchor bolts to in compression to in tension. So with that resulting force going out here, you needed these two right here in compression, these two in tension. The other or are the existing ones. So it wouldn't have kind of lined up anyways. So basically we put that transfer plate on top of there, put new, new uh, bolts on there, re-pour concrete buildup. Then it's like you got four new uh, anchor bolts, just attach it right to it. So again, uh, in, in detail, this is kind of a blow up of that, exist, that sheet I just showed you. There's the existing, we cut the top of the bolts off. We expose them with the concrete, get rid of the concrete down nine inches. Uh, we re-dye those, get some threads on there. We attach that, plate, that transfer plate, uh, bolt it down. Uh, re the concrete, get the concrete build, built up. And the transfer plate will then be embedded into that concrete along with all those nuts for the, the tops of the anchor bolts and the bolts, the washers and all that. And then you attach your pole. So that's the design we came up with. Textile liked it. Uh, this is a textile road, so uh, they approved it. The, the, the developer was the one paying for everything, so they just wanted it built. 
uh, once the contractor got out there, they didn't like that idea. They just wanted to do something different. This will work. They just didn't want to go and find that die and, and get out there. So what they ended up doing was they ended up chipping uh, the foundation all the way down uh, to the to the bent cap, which was nine feet total, uh, chipping it all the way down and just redoing all the anchor bolts. So that's what they decided to do. Um, six to one, half dozen to the other, a million ways to skin a cat. So that's that was one way. This is the way we designed it. But uh, again, there's that transfer plate detail. So that was an interesting one. Uh, again, it, it really took us by surprise when TechStock came back and showed us those photos because I really got on my project engineer that went out there to take the pictures and did the field work. And I was like, didn't you notice this? And he's like, it didn't look like that before. So luckily we had pictures to prove. All right, our second project is US 75 Park Lane down in Dallas, Texas. Um, US 75, as many of you all know, very, very busy uh, freeway leaving Dallas, going up to uh, McKinney, uh, to the north of Dallas. And US 75 was redone about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, they've got a lot of interesting features out there. As you can see, this was the bridge, the existing poles are at, and you can see the existing signals that need to be replaced. If you notice, a lot of this intersection is actually cantilevered, this bridge that kind of curves around. So you've got a lot of stuff kind of cantilevered over the main lanes. You've got a retaining wall here. You've got some 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 bent cat or some uh, some tie back straps, I believe. Uh, I could be mistaken there. I, I think there were, but we didn't want to um, disturb those. So again, the reviewing agencies for this was Textot Dallas and the City of Dallas, since this is a Textot Road. But the City of Dallas is going to maintain this and operate it once it was constructed. Uh, diamond intersection again on an existing elevated structure. Here's a plan view from up above. Now, one of the things you can see here that's interesting is you can actually see the armored joints that separate the actual bridge structure from the, you know, the, the dirt and the ground back behind that retaining wall. Here's the other one over here. If you notice that armored joint Again, here it is right here. It's hard to see, but it's right there. So this pole is actually cantilevered over the main lanes. It is attached and designed into the bridge structure. So in order to put a new foundation there, I'm sorry, this is the anchor. This is the, uh, the armor joint. Sorry, I went back too far. It's this line right here. So in order to properly do this, there, we didn't want to get into that bridge structure and have to redesign and, and get in there. It's very costly. Uh, you've got a lot of traffic here, TCP. We didn't want to cause that kind of disturbance. So we were tasked with trying to find a way to reuse these anchor bolts, which under normal circumstances probably aren't a big deal. But if you look at those anchor bolts right there, that pole is not a typical tech stop pole. It is a very uh, automatic a lot of uh, aesthetics out here. So we got the plans and here is the, ex the as-built plans for that, that uh, foundation. And as you can see, you have a, uh, four bolts here and you got four bolts here. So none of those bolt patterns line up with what Textot's um, bolt patterns are in their poles. So we struggled, went back and forth, tried to come up with a way to do this. Um, and you can see these are actually into the, the bridge boxes that they built under the bridge. It's all integrated into the bridge. It would have been one heck of a nightmare to get in there and, and take all of this out and redesign all this. So what we ended up doing was we designed, again, a transfer plate detail. And in this case, what it's going to do is you've got the four existing anchor bolts here that will attach to this plate. Here's the other four. And then in the middle, is the new anchor bolt structure. These anchor bolts will then take all the load and transfer it into these. Um, what our structural engineer did was he took the Dallas uh, District uh, Traffic Signal Support Structures mass time pull details and put a little note, little note here, basically uh, said, this is the modified detail, by the way. And he had to sign and seal it and said, uh, 
go ahead and look elsewhere in the plans because these are going to change because we need a different base plate on the bottom of that pole weld in, uh, in order to match up with the new anchor bolts we're going to put on. We couldn't get the same size anchor bolts onto that transfer plate. It just wouldn't work because of the size of the transfer plate. <clears throat> so here's the new transfer plate. It's kind of simple, not that big. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, that's the new base plate, the base plate that's going to get attached to the end of the or the bottom of the pole. And this will be manufactured at the factory when they manufacture the poles. So there, there's that. So we thought that would be good and great. Well, we also noticed that one of the poles was also a pedestrian pole. It also had a weird type of dual um, anchor bolt pattern. So for the signal, that will be sticking out of the ground a little bit with that, with that transfer plate. It's not a big deal. There's not a ped button on it. But at the ped button at, at, on the other corner that was cantilevered over the main lanes, you cannot have that pedestrians be tripping over that. Um, it was just not ADA compliant. So we actually had to bury uh, that transfer plate. So we just basically said, take out some of the bricks, some of the concrete, go down a few inches. Then you can put that transfer plate down below top of the brick pavers and then just pour concrete on top of it. That way it's kind of hidden. So that way, you, Pedestrians are tripping over it. So TechStot liked this idea and that's what they went with. And I believe this is under construction right now out there. The third intersection is uh, the one I like the best. Um, this is at IH 35, 635 at the Inwood Road, basically TNT. And you can see the relationship there where stuff's at. A plane is just up here, PGBT, and here's 635, downtown Dallas. So our client for this one was Textile Dallas. Um, this was on their dime. But uh, the reviewing agencies were not only them, but C Dallas, because again, they're going to operate and maintain these signals in NTTA, because as you can see, this is looking down the DNT, looking down towards the south, I believe. And uh, a, lot of the, a lot of this area down below here is belongs to NTTA. And you'll, you'll understand why we had to look down below instead of up on the bridge. As you can see, here's the existing signal poles that were up there. And they're kind of beat up. They're small. They're undersized. The master arm lengths aren't long enough. They're basically attached to, the, to this bridge. And this bridge could not be messed with. They said, you cannot touch the bridge. It's structurally... The way that bridge is built, um, again, I'm not a structural engineer, but you could not mess with that bridge at all. So here's an aerial view. Those are the four intersections. Uh, again, this is a split diamond. This is DNT going down here. This is 635 going up and through here. These are the 635 main lanes. This is the uh, LBJ Express through the middle of it. Then the other direction for 635. And then, of course, you've got these cloverleaf uh, on and off ramps, kind of like here and then this structure is all above all of that it's an elevated frontage road structure is what that ends up being so this is actually inwood road and the other is the 635 uh, frontage roads so you can see the four different intersections what's interesting about this and i'll show you a video of it in a second this is a huge intersection i mean this is a pretty long distance the signal controller is actually cantilevered off of this frontage road structure out here so whenever they went out, had to go out and service that um, signal control cabinet or get into it to change any of the timings or fix anything, they actually had to shut down one of the lanes here on the front road, get trap control, get trucks out there, climb over the rail onto this little concrete pad that's covering over live traffic with a short little rail that barely came up to your knees. And talking with the, the folks that maintain this, this was one of their worst intersections. They hated going out and servicing this one because it was just so dangerous to get out there. Here's a real quick video to show you what the whole thing looks like. This is taken from a drone. You can see the cabinet over there. South towards downtown Dallas. Basically the, the Galleria is right below us, right where this image is, the Galleria Mall. 
So like I said before, the, here's that cabinet, the existing cabinet that was out there. It had, it had an antenna on it for some communications. Um, basically there's two cabinets. I think one had a controller and the other had a battery backup. Um, you can see this railing isn't very tall, that, that concrete um, structure they're standing on, that ledge is not very thick. The whole thing would shake, you're over live traffic. It's, well, it was just a nightmare. I would not have wanted to get in there. Another issue we had with this, uh, this project was, um, here's the meter, but where this meter eventually gets its power from, we have no idea. We got the as built we followed the as built and where that meter was supposed to make a connection to the, to, to the trap, to the uh, transformer was not there. There had been other work going on on the corners of the intersection over the years and it's not there anymore. So that was a mystery to us. We had Encore go out, to, out there with us twice, many hours trying to trace it, trying to search it, find it. We could not find it. So I don't know how, but the contractor, I guess, eventually found it because that cabinet's no longer there. They took it all down. Uh, as you can see, here's the, the existing poles. Very, uh, very flimsy, small poles. They were hit a lot because they're fairly close to the edge of the road. Um, again, they, they don't cover all the lanes. The, the wind loading on these poles are not very good. They've been hit, they were dented. It, it was just a nightmare. Plus another thing that the city was worried about was um, whenever they get out here to do any signal timing, they wanna know what's going on at the lights and as you can see the lights are way over there and you can't see them on the other if you look the other direction here i'll show you real quick i believe i got it pulled up hopefully y'all can see this so there's there's the signals over there you can barely even see them way over there and then way over there so they hated it because they couldn't see what was going on what lights were green what lights were red it was just a nightmare so they asked us to come up with a solution to solve that. So, Textile again challenged us not to touch this bridge structure. So I looked at an aerial view of this and I said, hmm, what if we went with dual mast arms and mounted them on columns down to the bottom? Can we do that? And I thought we could. Look how close this column is to the rail of the main lanes. And I'll show you detailed pictures of this later. This was just real quick, just a schematic kind of proof of concept that this is gonna work or not. And since you've got two one lane roads at each of these intersections, you basically only need one pole with a dual mast arm. We'll take care of it. So this is uh, the one, the eastbound side, 635. And here's the westbound side of 635. And again, everything seemed to line up and it seemed like this would work. Because right now you've actually got a pole that's right here serving this direction. You got a pole right there serving that direction. Again, you got that pole, you got that pole. So instead of having two poles, you only got one pole. And again, it works out because if this direct connector down here, this, this uh, uh, clover leaf, if it was over a little bit more where that pole is, it may not have worked. I don't know how we would have done it, but it just so happens everything kind of worked out geometrically. So once I showed this to TechStop, they liked the idea and they said, well, let's try it. Because they were, they were wanting to give up on it. They said, we don't think we can do this. And the city of Dallas is just going to have to figure this out. Well, we figured it out. So here's our plans that we came up with. <clears throat> you can see um, got the poles out there. Uh, they're long enough to cover all the lanes. Now, where are we going to put the signal controller? They didn't want it in the middle. So we said, let's put it down at the ground level. Well, they didn't like that either, because again, you can't see traffic, you can't see the colors of the lights. Okay, well, we're gonna have to elevate it somehow. So we decided to build a catwalk structure, one on this side and then one on the other side of the whole intersection. So basically this is like a separate diamond intersection right here with two signals being run by this one controller. There's a catwalk system. So they would have to get out and climb over the railing to get onto there. Well, now we gotta stop traffic and all that. Well, I'm looking at the, the lane configurations. I said, well, no, not really, because you've got this lane that's a mandatory left. This lane's a shared through left, and that's a through lane. And that's how it's striped out there now, and it works. So I said, we don't need this third lane right here for a little while. Why don't we stripe this lane off, because nobody should be driving over it, and they've got a place to park their trucks. They can get out, crawl over that railing. It's a nice, secure catwalk. It's a lot better than being over live traffic uh, with a, on a bouncing concrete 
structure. So they like that idea. Here's the other side of the interchange, basically the same thing over here. We got the striped off. There's the catwalk structure. You know, I'll have detailed pictures of this in a minute. This was a 60 foot long mast arm. It's almost the longest you can have for dual mast arm combination. Uh, if we could have, if we would have had to have, we could have moved it out another five feet and gone with a 65 footer. But again, we were trying to get as close as we could as possible. Um, some of the limiting things was this storm sewer. It was a massive, like 70 or 80 inch uh, storm line. Uh, we potholed, made sure we knew where it was so we could miss it, and we did. Uh, so this pole got some flexibility. We can move it around a little bit, but the poles with the cabinets, they had to be pretty detailed, pretty right up next to the bridge structure because that catwalk was being designed and it needed to fit right in there. Here's an overview of the whole thing. And you can see uh, we've got one of the poles here, one of the poles there, one of the poles there, and one of the poles there. All the rest of that is the uh, conduit system. Um, at first, we were going to attach the conduits to the bridge, and TTA didn't like that idea. Uh, we can't use the existing conduit in the bridge because we don't know the condition of it. Um, some of it was exposed. It looked like the junction boxes were starting to rot and rust. So we said, let's just go ahead and bore under 635. That's really what TxDOT wanted. So we, we just made a long bore under 635, the main lanes, and the... Uh, uh, the LBJ Express. And then we, we get our connection for power over here, one power source over here behind one of the, the, the buildings. Um, since this is such a long run, we actually had to put a step down transformer over here in order to boost that voltage back up. Uh, for any traffic engineer, uh, you kind of know what all this is. It's term cable termination charts, electrical service details, wiring diagrams, pole details, all that good stuff, uh, signal phasing. Um, here's the transformer detail that we had to design for the other side of the ground on it. And I'll show you pictures of all this in just a minute. So here's a lot of the, a lot of the, the details that went into this. Again, Greg Burms, our structural engineer who designed a lot of the structural components of this. Um, this is the column detail um, for all all the columns. Um, the columns ranged, well, they were all 48 inches in diameter. They were all 25 to 28 feet high. Um, the drill shaft lengths uh, into the ground were anywhere from 15 to 25 feet. And again, that was all dependent upon uh, the, the combination of the mast arms, how long they were. And we also did have some soil bearings out here. So we were able to get uh, real precise on the, the soil that was out here. Here's some details of the catwalk structure, which again, I'll show you pictures of it here in a minute. Uh, for one of the poles, uh, we had to have it closer to the bridge deck, so we weren't able to get a full circle. So it's kind of a, a semi-circle, a little bit more than a half circle. And then we basically were telling them we need to be six inches max, two inches min. We didn't want that thing bumping into the bridge structure if either this column or the bridge structure would move at all. But we also didn't want it so far that somebody could slip and fall through there. So we thought six inches was the max. And then basically there's, there's rail all going all the way around here. Uh, on the other one, a little different. We had to make it a little bit farther away. So this is a full circle. And you'll see pictures of all this here in just a minute. Again, some of the framing plan for that, one of the catwalks, safety rail, elevation, the connection details, how we connected it all back into the, onto the column with an embedded plate. And here's the other one, half semicircle, the deck notch and all that. Again, this is all structural stuff. I don't understand much of it, but uh, it works. There's some more of the framing plan and the safety rail post layout and where they're gonna put all those. So let's look at the fun stuff. Here's the after. Here's the results. Um, this was uh, constructed about a year ago. There's one of the uh, signal cabinets. And again, there's two cabinets. One has a battery backup uh, system, which is basically a bunch of uh, deep cycle batteries. To keep the system going in case there's ever uh, an electrical uh, outage in the area. The lights will still, still work for a number of hours. Then the other is the cabinet with all the components that run the signal. Um, you can see it's a lot bigger 
lot more sturdier than the, the previous one. You can see the old pole was over here. Here's the little base for it still. Um, and here's the other base over here for this other arm that was there before. Here's some ground level shots. Um, this was before they turned it on. Uh, I brought some of my, uh, my young EITs. Uh, Stephen was my EIT. Devin was our intern for the summer. He's now a full-time employee and he's now a PE. They were out checking it out. Um, when they, this is when they first got the pole up there. Uh, nothing was on yet. You can still see the old pole back behind there and you can see how much farther this goes and how much bigger that pole is compared to what was out there before. I mean, it's just night, night and day. Here's some more photos of the catwalk structure. Um, this is the one that's kind of the half semicircle. One of the things they had to end up doing was, uh, this is a, a field change, was we had to put this, this uh, rail here because it was a little bit too far, a little bit too much of a space here for people to fall. So they had to go back and retrofit that into this uh, design, same with the other side. But somebody could just jump over this rail, pretty easy, their, their car's parked there. They can walk along through here and they can service and get into all these cabinets on either side. Um, I, th this is not the final part. I do want to go through some more pictures. Um, I've got a whole bunch of pictures. Shows more detail. These pictures were taken recently, but you can see this is ground level. That's the semi-circle one. You can see how close we, we actually got to the bridge itself. Just from either side, you can see the old conduit system still attached to the bottom of the bridge there. You can see uh, this is a, I think this is a segmented bridge is what they call it. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's very difficult to get into that bridge structure if you were to start attaching uh, a signal pole to that bridge structure. They just did not want us messing with it at all or anybody for that matter. So here's uh, one of the poles that did not have a catwalk structure and you can see we got it pretty close to the bridge. Um, we actually had an existing luminaire arm. We had to kind of dodge out there as well. That highlight that um, that illuminates the main lanes of the DNT. That's how close we got to the rail. <laughs> Pretty close with the threaded in there. So you can see the rail down at the bottom, how close we got and the bridge structure up at the top. So it was very, very detailed and precise. Um, I do know when we surveyed this, we wanted to make sure we knew exactly where all of this was. So we actually had a, our surveyor drive down here with LIDAR. Uh, they had mobile LIDAR, get really good images and uh, very precise elevations of everything in order to make it work. There's one of the ground boxes before that column. Uh, as you can see, there's some of the existing stuff that was up there. And like I said, it's starting to rust and wasn't in the greatest of shape. Plus, another reason why we didn't want to use existing conduit is because you had to keep the existing signal up and running. You can't put new cabling in there if there's existing cabling in there. You don't want to take the existing cabling out, have that signal down for God knows how long while you're trying to figure out how to thread the new stuff all throughout the system. So they said, no, we're not using that at all. Here's the bottom of the bridge structure. Here's the one that's the full circle. And again, you can see how close we got to it right there. On the ground box, another view of it a little bit farther off. Kind of looks like a pirate ship uh, uh, mast at the top of a pirate ship with the crow's nest. That's what we call it, the crow's nest. Uh, one of the things that I was concerned with that I talked to the out about was what's to stop a, uh, a, uh, a person that uh, begs for money and stuff from just hanging out there and sleeping there. And they said, really nothing. I said, well, I suggest maybe put a sign on there basically says no trespassing, stay off of there. And they said, well, there's no sidewalks up there. Well, I go up there a few months later and there was somebody somebody on it, <laughs> just like I told them. 
So, you know, those folks will find any place to rest. Uh, there were a whole bunch of, of those types of people that were living under the bridge as well that we saw while we were designing this. So we know they're out there. And I don't know why, but this will not. Okay, here we go. And this one we had to keep away from the bridge a little bit farther because of other uh, conflicts with that sanitary sewer or that storm sewer, I mean. This one's not as close to the bridge structure. That's why this one has a little bit longer of an arm. That, that arm's 60 feet long, that one arm, it's pretty long. And here's some more detail photos. There's the half circle. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, I would be more than willing to entertain them. Just don't get too technical because remember, I am not a structural engineer. There is a question for uh, Mike. Uh, can we see the recording again after, after it's over today? Sure, we can do it right now. And the reason why I don't have an after video is because um, the drones, I don't know how familiar you are with drones, but the drones actually have a, a, a tip in them that do not allow them to fly too close to airports. And it's constantly being updated. And before, um, the before drone shot was taken, and we were still far enough away from the Edison Airport, which shouldn't have mattered. But um, for some reason, the after one, uh, the, the Edison Airport wouldn't let the, the drone fly, even though we were far enough away. So that was just, I don't know, something faulty in the chip or, or whatnot, or something programmed incorrectly because that's all GPS based. So uh, we couldn't get any after drone video of this. Sean, how long did it take to get those, uh, that bolt problem, uh, bent bolt problem resolved? And was there ever any camera uh, photography of the area that would have shown who had done that? No, there wasn't. Um, there wasn't even any police reports. So uh, I'm fairly certain it had to have been a very large vehicle. Uh, I think if it was a smaller vehicle, it would have torn the oil pan out and really would have maybe ripped a tire off. Um, so that it had to have been a large vehicle. They had no police record of it. Um, so we don't know who did it, but they bent all four of them. So they must have really hit that thing pretty hard. I do know that it, it is fairly common to do that. Um, I'm working on a, another signal in Farmer's Branch, uh, Luna at Mercer. And uh, there was actually some pork chop islands, some directional islands out there. Uh, at each corner to make a, a channelized right. And uh, they planned to put a signal there when they built it 10, 12 years ago. They never ended up putting a signal there till just now we're designing it. And those anchor bolts uh, were all in there. Well, when we went out to design it, um, all the anchor bolts on all four corners, so that's a total of 16 anchor bolts were all bent and had been hit by vehicles. So, um, my suggestion is if you're ever designing something like that for future use, um, I've actually seen it where they will encapsulate those with concrete if you know they're not gonna be poured anytime soon. And then they just come back and chip the concrete off. It's like a cap, concrete cap. That way the anchor bolts won't be damaged. Um, or uh, otherwise you're just gonna have to replace them eventually anyways, so. Yeah, you often see them uh just exposed, uh, waiting for some future installation and not knowing how long it's going to be. So, the, yeah, you don't want to hit those. That really tear your car up. I mean, those, those are pretty, pretty stout. Yes. And now there's one more question on the, on the Q&A. And just remind you that if you have a question for Sean, you can uh, click on the Q&A box and type your question in. The uh, question from Dave is, any observation of the concrete foundation swaying in heavy wind 
causing the cage to impact the bridge? Oh, we've uh, been out there many, many times uh, on he heavy wind days, on light days. That column is pretty stout. It is not moving one iota. Um, so it's 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 pretty stout. It's a four again. It's a four foot diameter column. Uh, some of them are over twenty feet in the ground. Out of rebar. So we we built those things to withstand that, so they wouldn't sway and. That's what's happening so far. And that, that bridge structure is pretty stout too. So we really haven't seen anything that is going to scare anybody as far as impacting that crow's nest into the bridge. Looked like quite a few uh, uh, cracks in that concrete uh, uh, foundation for the pole. Um, that one right there? In that pole, yeah, a picture. I think that was a, that one right there. Mm -hmm. Those two there. Um, I think it's just um, superficial. I don't think they go very deep if they even are there at all. I think they may have different different pores when they poured it. In fact, I've got some pictures of the the cage if you guys want to see it when they poured it um, during construction. Are those actually cracks or maybe formwork? Uh, it may be formwork. Again, I'm not a I'm not a construction guy. Uh, there's the uh, one of the the uh, foundations. Uh, you can see the the rebar cage coming out of the ground. That's the size of the anchor bolts. That's how deep they go. They're huge. And you can see the yes. formwork there. Yeah, that looks like the formwork might have caused those. Uh... Yeah, I think it was. Um, well, you can see again how close we were. We had to make sure also in our design that when they put the arm out here, it wouldn't interfere with the existing stuff because the existing stuff can't come down to the, the new stuff's up. So we actually tried to get all our arms behind the existing so that during construction, it's not blocking what's out there. And then you can just take this down and bob your uncle. But uh, a couple of the cases we couldn't do that. The arm actually had to be out in front, so we had to make sure that the signal heads did not obscure the other signal heads. Uh, there's my son out there. <laughs> he was checking it out. Um, I think I've got another photo here that showed. The formwork, uh, there's some more of the formwork you can see right there. Um, there was one interesting photo that actually had, and I'm sorry, my computer is lagging today pretty bad. Let me see if I can find it here. Here we go. They actually secured the, um, the framework to the, uh, to the guardrail which I thought was stupid. If a car would have hit that guardrail, they could move that. And while the concrete was still curing, it could have upset that column. Well, it's a means and methods thing. And they got away with it. Texas didn't say anything. So anyways, all four or all three of the clients, uh, Textot, NTTA, and the city of Dallas, they had massive comments on this project. So it was a lot of back and forth. A lot of, you know, the city of Dallas was operating, maintaining it. So they ultimately wanted, you know, things the way they want it because that's how they, they do things. The text is like, well, that's not how we do things and we're the ones building it. And then NTTA had their say as well. They didn't want things hung on the bridge. They had some aesthetic issues, um, things like that. They, they were worried about ingress and egress of, uh, of the trucks and the construction equipment. Because again, you're in the middle of an interchange with direct connectors and you're surrounded by main lanes. So we actually came up with a, a really cool uh, detailed um, plan to get trucks in and out. There are openings in some of the guardrail so that they can safely pull off and get into there. Uh, again, you don't have a lot of uh, acceleration or deceleration out there because this is the DN team that they're hauling, hauling butt out there. So, uh, Anyways, it, it all worked. There were no accidents. And uh, 
I do know NTTA does have cameras out here. And a lot of times when we were out here, NTTA truck would show up if we were out there too long. So we had to make sure we had our safety vests on and hard hats every time we were out there. That's another reason why we couldn't get any closer uh, once the concrete was, was there is this form had to come off, on and off. So you can only get so close to that bridge structure. All right, well, there are no further questions. Uh, thank you very much, Sean, for the informative presentation. And uh, thank you all for uh, joining the webinar. As mentioned previously, individual registrants for the webinar will receive an attendance acknowledgement without any further action within a few days of the webinar. If you're attending in a group, your site coordinator whoever registered will receive the attendance acknowledgement for distribution uh, to all in attendance. And if you're interested in presenting a Texas section webinar, please email, and the email address is vptech, vptech at texasce.org, vptech at tex ASCE.org. You can also go to the webinar page on the Texas section website for a list of upcoming webinars. We have a, a February 23rd one on flood warning and reducing flood risk. One on March 9th about uh, drought challenges for Texas. And one on March 23rd, the Texas Disco Disaster Recovery Mitigation and Planning Programs. We're always uh, available to answer questions, feel free to email the, the VP Tech email address. And uh, thank you for attending. And let me turn it back to Mike from ASCE Texas section staff to conclude the session. All right, thank you, Bob. And thanks again, Sean, for the wonderful presentation. Looks like we're wrapping up a few minutes early, so you get an extra long lunch break today. Uh, everyone have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. Bye.